light these candles of hope, peace, joy, and love as signs of the coming light of Christ, as the Lord has promised in days to come. The Lord will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child. She shall bear a son and name him Emmanuel. God is with us. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this fourth Sunday of Advent, December the 20th. This is our digital worship for the day. We're glad you could join us and we hope that you take something from, from this that helps you in the week to come and in the season to come. And even though we don't know when, someday we will meet again in person, no matter what the restrictions. And we do hope, if you are, have been visiting us online but have never visited us in person, that you'll join us and try us out to, to see how we fit in with your relationship with God. Now let us pray. Oh God, we thank you that Jesus showed your love for every person, babies and children, old people and young, sick people and those who were strong, rich people and those who were poor. Come to us this Advent season and give us love in our hearts for all people as well. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, whose birth we await. Amen. Our scripture for the day, actually we have two scriptures. The first scripture is from Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26. Listen carefully for the word of God. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it.
Our second portion of scripture comes from the same story. In fact, it's just a continuation of the verses we read beforehand. So listen still for the word of God. Now in those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. God's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. God has shown strength with his arm. God has scattered the proud in their thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise God made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months, and then returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God for it. It's the seventh night of Hanukkah. It's the seventh night of Hanukkah, and this celebration has a, a prayer in it. It's called the uh, Baal Hanasim. And it's a prayer giving thanks for God's assistance, for God's help when the Maccabees, or the Hasmoneans, uh, rebelled against Antiochus, a Seleucid king who had taken over Jerusalem and captured the temple, defiled it, sacrificing pigs on the altar, and removing all indications of the god that the, Jew the Jews worshipped, and placing in a statue of Zeus. His desire was to make these Jews Greeks. And prior to the invasion, many of those Jews had decided they wanted to not be outsiders, and so they began to conform to a lot of Gentile ways, but when Antiochus came in and took over Jerusalem and took over the Judean area and basically conquered the area, he followed that with a number of slaughter, slaughterings and uh, of men, women, and children, and then really cracked down on any worship of Judaism at all. No one could worship the God of the Jews. They had to worship the, the God that Antiochus had put up. A group called the, the Maccabees took a small group, a band of people uh, known as Hasmoneans or Hasmoneans, and outnumbered, outarmed, they took on this, this king and they were able to retake Jerusalem. And they held it. And they 
retook the country. And the prayer itself is a prayer of thanksgiving for God's helping them as they try to restore God's presence and sanctify the temple and the country once again in doing that. This is the heart of Hanukkah, and this being the seventh night of Hanukkah, it seems appropriate that I should bring it up. There's nothing wrong in Christianity in understanding that the way that Jews have looked at how their miracles work, this, is, this prayer is a prayer that gives thanks for God's presence, knowing the essential presence, the essential help that God gave. And yet it also remarks about how we participate in those miracles. If those Maccabees, that family, had not been incensed and tired of being, watching their own faith be annihilated and brought to a state of total unimportance and possible um, uh, extinction. They refused to not do anything. And even though they had the small numbers and even though they were out armed, they were willing to place their, their lives, their well-being, their everything into the hands of God and participate in a way of that should have meant certain death. And yet God came through. This is something that Israel has done before that, and they've done it since. A small group of people who devote themselves to, at least at that time, devoted themselves to the idea that they needed to return to their faith in order to be free of these Gentiles that were destroying their world. The willingness to participate in the miracle allows God to work with us and make that miracle. That is an interesting concept. Now, why am I mentioning this after reading Mary's story? After all, Mary is not given a choice on being the mother of this child of God, this incarnation of God. She is told she has been chosen. She is told she's going to participate. But she does have a voice in this. First thing she does after she finds out she's pregnant is run. She leaves her home and goes out into the woods and finds a small town, the town where her cousin is. Her cousin accepts her because she understands miracles. She herself fought barren at an extreme age, is bearing a child, a son. And that son will be the precursor to Jesus, the prophet who prepares the way. So, she could have stayed with Elizabeth. She could have remained apart from Joseph. But she doesn't. She returns. She goes in actually at a time when she'd be showing. And people, she couldn't hide the fact that she was pregnant. 
In the meantime, Joseph had made the choice not to dismiss her based on a dream. So he was fully in. He was participating on something that he had really, if you think about it, it's kind of hard to believe that he would want to. He knew he wasn't the father. And the story probably of, of God's over, overshadowing Mary and making her conceive would sound as outlandish as if we said it today. But he took a risk. And he placed everything in on the fact that this child would be Son of God, God incarnate. So they both participate. Now the title of the sermon is Just Who is Our God? But what I talk about is human participation. But don't let that fool you. The very fact that God becomes incarnate and chooses this way to become incarnate tells us a lot about our God. You see, to be asked to participate in this incarnation, this to be asked as Mary and Joseph were asked, to, to raise this incarnation of God, is also a participation of God. God is also taking a risk, if you will. This young, young teenager, this young teenage unwed mother, is going back to a town that really, by all rights, could have her stoned to death. She and her child stoned to death. It is the law. It is the law of, the, of Moses. Joseph could prevent possibly being viewed as a laughing stock, if not behind his back, in front of his back. I mean, in front, in front of him, uh, by not receiving her. But he does. And he risks that reputation. And reputation's important in a small town, as those of us who live in this small town know. And God... God lets these two powerless people, this very powerless child, and we're talking 12, 13 maybe. It was very common for 12-year-olds at that time to be married. Truth is, it wasn't until the first century AD that Emperor Augustine finally, once and for all, put a limit on how young you could marry how young a woman had to be before she could get married. Often, they were 12, 10. They were even accounts of 8 and 7. And this was everybody, not just the Romans. It was also the Jews, also the Greeks, also many people. Now, so this is a very young child raising God, taking a risk. Joseph taking a risk. God taking a risk. All of these people risking. But what, but what for us? Why does God take this risk? Think about what the Incarnation actually was able to do for us. 
God did not need to know what it was like to live as a human. Because God knew. Even though God doesn't doesn't was hasn't lived as human as we knew it. God's omniscient. God doesn't need to know. But we needed to know something about God. And you can write about God. You can have laws about God. You can listen to prophets explain God. You can read stories about God. But it's not the same as if you see God in action as somebody you understand. Another human. The ultimate living book. To let us know what it is, what is the nature of God? What is the nature of God's love? People could feel it. They could know it. What is the nature of God's anger? They saw it. What is the nature of God's sadness? They saw it. What does God really want us to know? He spoke it. All of this is what comes with an incarnation of God. But there's another thing in here, too. We also get to see what God created us to be. Because Jesus is fully human. He's subject to the same frailty. There is absolutely nothing about about in scripture that tells us that he couldn't have had a cold, he would have. Colds happened. He got angry, we know that. He got sad, we know that. He was afraid, afraid. We know that too. It says that in scripture, as he prays to be relieved of the cup that he must drink, as he yells out on the cross, why have you forsaken me, my God? We have so many examples of how God created us to be human. No, we can never be perfectly God, perfectly perfect like God, but we are human beings, and it is possible to work toward living that perfect human life that's been shown to us. We may never reach it, but it's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't try. That's part of the incarnation, too. To be told that this is what humans are being asked to do. Now, what does that boil down to? It's to participate with God. As God participates in us, our lives, and in creation. Interacting with us, working through us, trying to help us become every bit the humanity we are supposed to be. Even though we have mucked things up so badly, a God like our God does not give up on us. This is what we understand. And we are not to give up on God. It is a call for all of us here at First Presbyterian Church in Shelbyville, Kentucky to look at the, the context we're working in now of a pandemic where we've been forced to change so much and forced to learn new things and we have continued to participate as a church, imperfect, imperfectly as it may be. But we are 
trying to find the way to be the best faith community possible, participating in God's actions in this world, making ourselves available like Mary makes herself available. What we can't see, God already knows. But we're getting a glimpse of it. As I talk with other pastors, as I talk with members in our own church, we are learning skills that will make being a connected church a lot easier, particularly for younger families and younger people whose jobs are now they, they encompass so much time of one's life. We can now do things without having to gather in a building. And that's going to help us in the future. We know what it means to be with one another. And that's going to really help us. We miss each other. And there are many out there who can't even witness these particular services that we do show. They can't participate in the live shows, the live, the live services, excuse me, that we have. But we can figure out ways to make that happen. And we are reminded that our participation doesn't just stop at looking into a at looking into on a screen to see a service or to listen to somebody rant on or to be able to enjoy music from Tom but it also should remind us that regardless of what not gathering together we still have an obligation to be supportive of each and every one of us, supportive of the financial needs of this congregation, supportive of the missions that we're trying to do in as best we can. Mary participated in the miracle of Jesus, of the Incarnation just as God did. Joseph participated in that miracle of incarnation, just as God did. All risked. All took chances. And we are the better for it. It tells us that we need to take chances too. We need to participate, too. Because as we participate, so does God. And it's amazing what God will be able to do. Stuff we can't imagine. Because who would have thought that a little baby who poops in his diapers, who toddles around, who wakes up at night with an earache, who screams and yells who wanders off and gets lost at 12. Who would have thought that that baby, that child, would be the salvation of the world? I wonder what God's going to do next if we participate. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us once again go to God in prayer. Gracious, loving God, we want to spend our time preparing ourselves to hear again the message of the angels to go in heart and mind to Bethlehem and to see the babe lying in a manger. We long to hear again from the Holy Scriptures the tale of your incarnation, from your birth until your final victory over sin and death through this holy child. 
and we long to make this house of prayer glad with our carols of praise and our shouts of joy. But it is not the time for that now. Before we celebrate, we call on you for the needs of the whole world, all of your beloved creation. And so we pray. We pray for peace upon this very earth that Christ came to save, for love and unity within one church, which the Spirit continues to guide and empower, for goodwill to be among all peoples, as Jesus taught to us. We particularly pray for the poor, the cold, the homeless, the hungry, the oppressed, the loveless, and the unloved, the sick, the grieving, the despairing, and the depressed, and those we now name in the silence of our hearts. Bless them all, God, using us wherever you will, and let them sense your calming presence and experience your healing love as you answer their needs. Lastly, let us remember all those who rejoice with us, but have gone before us, whose hope was in the word made flesh, who now dwell with you and with whom, through the life, death, and resurrection of this very child, we forevermore are made one with you and one another. We humbly offer to you these prayers and praises through the words that Christ himself taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now... May the God of grace, the Lord of life, and the spirit of truth grant you grace, peace, and wisdom, and be present with you always. Amen. <laughs>